<laughs> but I got, I'm not going to do both of them. I'm just going to get one of them. Okay. Okay, Paul. Yeah. Um, the one I'd like to do is, first of all, is to thank uh, all of the staff uh, from the different departments that made the Church Street celebration a huge success. It was a great day, and it brought out some of the area's best gospel talent, and it, uh, it made a whole lot of people happy. John Ramstad and his team, along with Virginia Arts Festival, North Police Department, Fire Department, and others. It was great, and uh, I'd like to thank the manager you know, for making that happen. It was an un unforgettable uh, afternoon. So just thank you, and, and you'll be surprised. I said about seven or 800 people there. Yeah, that was and, downtown, all of which yeah. So I'll hold up on, on everything else. <laughs> Couple things. I noticed one of our agenda items we get like four million dollar grant for Lafayette River. Yes. Or Green Street. What, what is it? Can somebody at some point? Wetlands restoration, oyster beds, and living shoreline. Um, that is. Uh, come to the city or to the. To the city. There's our stormwater division. Really. That's something that needs to be celebrated our rather than just stuck in an ordinance. I mean. I well, keep talking to you about pushing good news out. This is the second this time we've we actually done this. We, this is just to spend it. Yeah. So we received the award several months ago. <coughs> this is just letting us spend the money. Who is, well, I hope our commu the community gets to know about it. Yes, sir. Yeah, so. who, is, how, who is orchestrating the spending? And you may have heard it about corporate rentals and vacation rentals. Being yeah, I've said it. Town. Uh, just some citizens of some houses that have not been able to be sold. We're going to get a report on that. They're going to daily, nightly, weekly event rentals uh, in single family. I mean, single family neighborhoods. We have more of them under enforcement uh, action. Out more of the we'll go ahead and force. Um, one of the things I said to you is that you know, as we move forward with the concept of coastal character district, we might actually want to think about whether vacation rentals would be something we'd want to provide an opportunity for um, in some way to so have the other banks to manage um, as a way to perhaps add some value houses that aren't selling that obviously has some potential negative consequences for the area. So we, it's, it's a conversation. But right now, um, if it's if, if you have a dwelling unit, it requires occupancy for 31 days or longer. Um, if you have a motel unit, it requires occupancy of 30 days or fewer. And so 30 days is, is the lot. So we're renting it for Shorter than a 30 day period, um, we cite him for illegally operating a motel unit in the residential zone. Okay. You had some calls on that too? Yeah, that I forwarded the George, and they, he told me they were, they had some enforcement cases on it. I think some of it too is that the actual property owner doesn't want to take responsibility for it and says that it's the person who's renting the house. From him that they need to be held accountable but it doesn't work that way well at the end of the day when you're the property owner yeah okay <clears throat> last thing is I had a call from I guess Lynn or, or someone at the senior center we're not planning changing anything in their venue down there at the senior center I'm okay. yeah, getting a lot of phone calls on that too at the Norfolk Fitness and Wellness Center somebody is evidently going around saying it's going to be a big change, and I think. Sorry, was it Wellness? Well, it's yes. the senior center is down there, and they, they've got a lot of programs that they're doing very well. And somebody has told them, and I couldn't get a name, that there were some changes coming up, and they're very nervous about it. Okay. It would have. It was discussed at their board meeting. Okay. Yep. So we need to assure them. I mean. It, there's nothing you're saying there's nothing going on. I had told him I hadn't heard. So 
we need to sure, sure. if your status is safe. Okay. Or is there something going on that you haven't heard yet? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing here, that right? I'm aware of right now, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, somebody's talk is, is saying, spreading the rumor. Okay, we'll, we'll get we'll information on that. Okay, and the last, I would like to thank the manager and his staff, Mr. Morgan. We raised a little bit of money. The school system has made uh, Powhatan, their frame helped, and got some other contributions, made Powhatan feel available this Saturday for the uh, Pop Warner Sports <coughs> in Norfolk, and they're going to have it all day. And I mean, It wasn't being used, we didn't put it, but uh, it took a lot of work. Kids feel like they're going to Yankee Stadium Saturday morning. So I mean, they're all they normally practice in Huntersville, so this is a step up, a major upgrade for their and they have I think six levels of teams that they'll be playing Saturday. So thank you. I know Morgan for the yes, I'm giving you kind of credit because I think you <laughs> there's some it. leakage that I'll get from that. But anyway, then we got down to a reasonable number. So that's gonna be a big day. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Mamie? I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I do, but I only bring up one because the other five got answered. Um, could I possibly have an update on the landscaping for the medians in our city, the schools, and the schedule for grass cutting, edging, and beautification? We really need to take a look at our schools and to find out what the guidelines are um, as far as the shrubbery. Um, we've had cases where the shrubs have grown up to the windows, so you can't see out of the windows of the, the, the school. Let's see. Hi. Hi. I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but remember I had the summer project? Yes. Um, so five weeks ago when you left, I was tasked with it to look at the landscape paintings. And I'll tell you simply and directly, so we, what we did was we, we hired more people immediately okay. who, who sought to, uh, over extended hours that included Saturdays. Those Saturdays were uh, August 15th, the 22nd, 29th, and pending September 4th. We bought more equipment, which included uh, herbicides and string trimmers. We targeted areas. We worked with our partners. We worked with Dr. Thornton at Norfolk Public Schools. And we've gotten on a rotation, we hope, that meets that September 8th opening. Uh, I know that and if you were at schools and you see what you what you saw, and our hope is to, to make sure we knock those out so the first day back, everyone has clean schools. Now, understanding all that, and, and that Mr. Wynn brought in weed and put it at Mr. Uh, Mark, Mr. Jones's test this evening, this fall we're going to look at some, most or all, being um, put out to bid. Uh, what we've had, what's happened in the past, we've had part or some of our maintenance that we put out to bid that we've gotten a good response for, and what happens is that they get involved, and it seems like the crew or the crew that we've gotten can't handle it. So we're working with procurement, with our post, what we intend to do is to figure out what the right mix is, what we can maybe hold on to, and maybe what we can put out to bid. So I'm praying you saw some kind of difference. I did. Uh, okay. Um, and they, they did my school first, so I'd stop complaining about it. <laughs> good move. <laughs> and so, they did a good job. It's yeah, done. It's winter that the, the grass was so high yes. that when they do cut it, there's lumps right. all over the grounds. But yes, I did see some improvement. So thank you. Thank you. And it wasn't without conversations. Thank you. Just okay. as an addendum to that, not, you know, I don't know whether we have water trucks or not. Willers and trees like <coughs> Ramson Avenue, we're in a severe drought. And here again, we've gotten to where we're planning more than we can take care of. And every year I say, let's don't plan anything until we can take care of everything we God, as far as weeding and watering, and you can look as you ride home down the ground, it'll be dark by then. But we're losing trees because we can't get water. Yeah. It's good. It's a okay. bad problem. Well, I think that's going to become a budget. That should be a budget issue for yeah. us. I mean, we've heard about this. Remember a few years ago, we bought a truck and equipment, and we, in a budget, actually put, I guess, three or four jobs in there for our people who could do that. But right. probably time to end that. Sure. Back in the day, Mason Andrews had the fire department ordered 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. First time around. Okay. Is that it, me? Yes. Um, okay. Um, a lot of complaints have been coming in about the young children um, on the football teams that are begging um, for money in the medians. I, I, I don't know what's going on with the enforcement of that, but it's something that we really need to look into. I just personally am against it because it's teaching the kids the wrong way to raise money, um, putting your helmet out in traffic and asking people to throw money in it isn't a good way to raise money. There's, you know, we try to teach kids to work for it by selling things or, do you know, um, I, I don't know. I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but there's been a lot of it. And we need to find out why, why that's happening because if our um, Parks and Recreation is doing a great job with uniforms and everything, why, where is the additional money needed? Is it really because we're trying to get our football teams at a different status um, with the clothing that they're wearing? Or is it about um, actually buying the equipment they're needed? If that's the need, then we need to know that money. But I don't think that's it. I think it's trying to get extra things beyond what a normal <coughs> football uniform has. <coughs> they may not be city teams. You're right, and they may not be city teams. So, yeah. Um, but if they're out on the medians, police need to stop and they need to say, you know, you can't do this. You have to have a permit or you have to go through a process that's dangerous for our kids. They shouldn't be out there. Especially at um, Valentine and Virginia Beach Boulevard and Broad Creek. They're out Northampton there. Boulevard and um, yeah. Military yeah. Highway. Yeah. They're, you know, Okay. Sunday, at the corner of Collie uh, and Colonial, there were two young boys in uniforms. Uh, they couldn't have been third or fourth graders. There was not an adult in sight. Okay. And they were just, you know, walking up to cars and holding out their helmets. I mean, nice young, you know, young boys, but there wasn't, there wasn't an adult anywhere. It wasn't like, you know, anyway. I think kind of maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe I I know, I know, some too. resources. Not a coach, to... no, not anybody, not even yeah. an 18 year old young. I mean, they're, they're just these two kids all by themselves. To figure out okay. what the needs are. We'll like address them. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I was going to praise the work that's being done with the landscaping and the medians. So I appreciate okay. it. Can do that. Yeah. yeah. Because we'll they did yours. <laughs> 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 no, I've seen um, they did Cromwell. Um, after that, Thank uh, you. I did want to add though, we need to hit uh, Northampton Boulevard where the outlet mall is going to go all the way up through Military Highway. There are some tall weeds growing through there. It's just an area that's probably not um, hit as much, but they need to trim the bushes and um, take care of that. But other than that, I have seen some great improvements throughout the city with that, and I've been watching. I um, also want to thank Public Works for the line striping that's been done all throughout the city. I don't know if anybody else has noticed that but they've done a tremendous job. They did leave out one little area on the East Little Creek Road um, from Southern Shopping Center, the Chesapeake Boulevard, that was on an original list. It, the lines are basically gone there. But other than that, a lot of people have made comments about the improvement of, of that. So we appreciate um, getting that done as well. I did have some concerns about our hotel inspection after the fire of the M-Star Hotel, and the owner of that property has 65 violations but what was more distressing for me was reading the article and quoting uh, they were quoting people who were living in the hotel for months and I know we used to have a program where we were going in and checking that on those on a regular basis and I know there's ways around it that can move people around in rooms but it just concerned me to see um, you know that people were telling the press and some of the um, TV media when they were interviewing people was actually kind of embarrassing for us as a city. So if we can look into what we're doing with that um, inspection program, if it's working, what do we need to do to continue um, that enforcement? I thought we had a rule of 30 days that somebody can't stay more than 30 days in a hotel. Um, I think it's... It is 30 days. 30 days. You used to put up the Christmas ornaments. Right. And I know we can't get to every one of them, but maybe we need to do some um, random targeting and, and go through some of these places. So can that property be rebuilt? Is it damaged enough so it can't be re can't be rebuilt, George? Um, I can help you on that. Uh, you can, we also have a meeting yeah. about the hotel motel inspections today. Um, yes, sir. We believe that it is one fifty percent damage, and we believe that as a result, we'll have to demolish. Because all of those were made not for me uses in nineteen eighty seven. 
Is that one though? That one's still zoned C2, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's accepted. It's got to be demolished, but I think that the zoning permits a new hotel on that yeah. site. Yeah. Well, you wanted to put apartments there anyway. The, the current zoning requirements, including elevation and things like that. So, uh, yes, if somebody wanted to rebuild it back. However, that uh, the owner was. was it, 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 <coughs> I'm requesting the guy to get the burden of the condo for some time. So. Yeah. And then finally, I know um, some of you may start hearing complaints or uh, Dominion Power is going through and knocking on doors as part of Virginia General Assembly has given them money, I guess, to underground power lines and areas that um, are, have been prone to outages for long enduring storms. And Farida has been doing, once again, a great job. She responds instantly on that, but some people are, um, it's particularly happening where they just did the transmission line replacement. So now Dominion Power is going back through that area, now saying, oh, we're going to underground your power lines. So there's some civic leagues now in that section that are up in arms, and it probably will be happening in other parts of the city soon. But just to make everybody aware um, that they, they have some money now, I guess they have to have a certain amount um, underground um, by a certain time period, and they gave them money to do that. And so they've identified the neighborhoods? Um, yeah, I think um, Frida has a map, um, that, or Dominion Power has a map that they just posted online that shows the areas that are prone to, it is optional for the homeowner, so they the, each homeowner doesn't have to do it, but it's the undergrounding of the line from the pole to the house, uh, and, and so um, that's where you get that knock on the door and there's somebody there saying we're going to do this. They apparently do a really good job with it, so it's not, <coughs> it, but people are just, you know, cautious about it. If we, if we can get information in our Dropbox about that, uh, maybe other council members would appreciate hearing seeing what's going on. That's it. I'll say one thing. Uh, it's unfortunate uh, about the persons who have to stay in these hotels but from the old red carpet in who used to be at uh used to be at Tidewater Drive the, the people who live in these hotels are an inch from being homeless and um, it's just unfortunate that we it's not unfortunate we have an uh, uh, ordinance you know uh, that limits it to, to stay there but I think we need to recognize the fact that the people who have to stay in hotels are an inch from being homeless uh, the red carpet in was actually a little community. Uh, you had everything going on there that went in in another community. So <clears throat> it's like a double-edged sword. You know, you you want to stop homelessness in Norfolk, but if you enforce things like this, which is an ordinance on the book, you are adding to the homelessness. You know. Yeah. The, the, one of the issues, though, is it gets that's actually a very expensive housing proposition for some of these people. Yeah, it is. You know, because some of these. Folks who are renting these rooms take real advantage of it. Yeah. The folks who are there, they, they, they can't, they can hardly come up with a month's deposit to get it in a real apartment, and so they wind up paying a lot more money at some of these, right. you know, some of these motels and take advantage of them. That's and I'm concerned about safety have, on you that. Have several of them in one bed and one room. I mean, it's, yeah. we need to find out where it's happening so we can do a better job of servicing. And I think more, I understand that too, but safety wise is that if you're, they are gonna do it, is when fire alarms and things aren't working in these or people are moving all of their belongings <coughs> into these hotel rooms, um, the safety you know, aspect of that. Sure. I, I know it's still under investigation what caused the fire, but it's still, it has, we're lucky that nobody lost their life in that fire with as many people that were in that hotel at the time. <coughs> Angela, did you have anything you wanted to been approached by one citizen maybe a couple who wanted to, re to reactivate this music walk of fame and um, you know mr. Friedman with Birdland sure and his son is yeah. uh, is quite a uh, 
history student of Norfolk music, and he has some ideas. And we haven't done it in a while. In fact, after Mr. Decker sort of passed away, we didn't, you know, the thing sort of felt nothing happened much. So um, Breck has got the names of the old group, and <coughs> I asked him to, if it, the council thinks it's okay, but we, he could reconvene the group. Most of them are still here. Uh, I would like to get Mr. Friedman pointed to it, Brian, and, and uh, we'll bring that back. And if anybody has any other ideas, this is really a good, a good. Uh, um, you know, it's a happy thing. There are some people on a list that they had that never made it, like Adolphus Stork mm -hmm. over at Norfolk State, or uh, one of his guests, and some people like that. Lucian Montag. Lucian Montag. Yeah, he played in so many bands. I mean, I Same think the case, there's a, in fact, Rec read me the list, there are probably 25 names that didn't make it that you could, we could, they could talk about. So we usually like to do, what we were doing is maybe have four of them at one time so we could create enough excitement, not just one at a time. But, and, um, so we'll take another look at that if that's okay. Sounds like a job for one of them. Alan Bull is our guy. Alan Bull. One, oh, one more thing, because you're talking feel good. Um, on Friday night, I won't be here, but on Friday night at Booker T, they're um, renaming the Booker T Washington Field after Cal Davidson, who was the football coach there for a number of years and you know made a huge contribution to Booker T. So um, that's going to be Friday night at the football game. Yeah. Um, Marcus, I think if uh, if Terry were here, she might bring it. She probably would have brought this up, but it's really, um, this predates you, so I mean, this is not anything that you hear posted, but uh, on 43rd Street, the banners hanging from um, the uh, housing units over there that are, you know, that, that started out as an effort on behalf of the city to create workforce housing, all up and down 43rd Street, and we were persuaded that Community Development Corporation should do that instead of the Housing Authority because they knew apparently we're closer to the community or whatever and there were some people we know that were on the CDC and uh, somewhere along the line we lost track of what we were trying to accomplish. It went from, from home ownership to rental housing and now student housing and the banners were from some of the newest units actually. Um, I mean, I, you know, just for those of us who were there at the beginning who had good intentions, if, if somebody could explain to us what happened. What, I mean, I understand that some of the deed restrictions didn't make it to the deeds. Is that true, Bernard? Or, yes, it is true. So, but I, I'd like to know, like, why and how. Or, as I recall, some of the units were actually, maybe the market went away because of the housing recession, the bubble or something. Or, I mean, I know it's not just all black and white. There's lots of gray shades in there, but, you know, there's some lessons to be learned there. I mean, what was supposed to be workforce housing for people who actually worked at Old Dominion or maybe police, it's now, you know, they are units that people are well, renting out to students that, um, you know, and they back up against Lambert's Point. We had really hoped that that would be a nice buffer between the neighborhood and Old Dominion. And, you know, they've got college kids in there. The notion that this would be, you know, a really good thing for the neighborhood probably is not true in the moment. So, but it'd be nice to have some way to do a survey of who's there, who owns it. I mean, all of that stuff. So we, so it doesn't happen to us again. I mean, because it has money involved. In yeah, and we actually, I mean, I, I think we actually donated the property. I don't know that. We owned all of that stuff. We were trying to do something really positive. So, I mean, there's a story there that we ought to at least learn from. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mayor and members of Council. We, I'll just do a quick agenda overview before I turn it over. I think Peter will be up, be up first. So, um, what we'll have is a, a project updates, and today, tonight, we'll focus on some of the commercial corridors, not uh, planning uh, of what we intend to do, but a report on the community input we have and the projects that were actually happening. We'll also get an update from the uh, Virginia Zoo. Greg is here tonight. I think that's something that 
uh, Councilor Riddick had asked for uh, earlier in the summer. And then we have uh, uh, three real estate matters for closed session. But before I turn it over to, to Pete to give us uh, an intro to some of the project updates, there are three bits of good news I'd like to uh, share with Council. And I believe uh, two of the three you may have uh, uh, received information already. But Forbes, it listed uh, Norfolk as um, you know, five things that make Norfolk, Virginia a hidden gem. And it went from our mermaids to arts to food to beer and just the, the location. It's, you know, the water is something that's special to, to us. Also, and I believe the mayor, you were quoted in this, the White House recently uh, joined the cities of service uh, to announce 10 cities across the country. The first cities for the uh, Brazilian America core cities in the United States. It's uh, kind of interesting when you look at the list of cities from Anchorage to Boulder to Chicago, El Paso, New Orleans, Norfolk, Pittsburgh, uh, Phoenix, Tulsa. And Winter has assured me that um, M-I-N-O-T is Minot, North Dakota, because his wife is from North Dakota. And watch we find out that it's something else, but he's assured me that's the correct pronunciation. So we're very uh, happy, not just the 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 grant, but also some of the human capital that will be a part of, of that. And again, we're getting world recognition, worldwide recognition for how we are dealing with, with water. And then lastly, uh, I think some people would suggest that the, the administration went into this kicking and screaming, but uh, the, the park happy. Uh, a while ago, we talked about how can we change this whole concept of, of parking and could we uh, not try to get every coin that we could get? Can we make sure that parking doesn't become a detriment for people coming to visit the city. So kudos, they go out to the DNC. They were uh, recognized by the International Downtown Association for the Park Happy Campaign. So anything from the, the free parking, metered parking, or two-hour parking on weekends to just the technology that we have with, with parking has been recognized. So three bits of good news. Um, to start have great. music playing in the background. <laughs> <No. laughs> I to be careful, right? The, the music and we'll So, um, unless right. there's something else for, for you, Mayor or Council, I'd like to turn it over to the people. Thank you, Council. 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 Thank you, Council.
uh, the SBA has put their stamp of approval on this, as well as a number of other federal uh, agencies. Uh, we are the first entity to launch this program in the region, so we're very proud of that. And we've got eight businesses signed up to participate. Again, what we want to do with all of these programs is under-promise and over-deliver. So we didn't want to start with two dozen manufacturers. We wanted to start with eight. And by the way, the focus is on manufacturing enterprises that have the capacity to become strong exporters. And so we're going through, we went through the selection process while uh, you were on hiatus. So we're excited about that. Um, we are also making considerable progress on a lot of brick and mortar projects. I said a second ago that economic development is not just about brick and mortar, but brick and mortar is the stuff that's very visible and very important and in many respects uh, helps to pay the bills, as it were. So I'm not going to read through, <laughs> I'm not going to go through the details of every slide, but one of the themes, one of the recurring themes, or among the uh, recurring themes that you'll see with all of these is some combination of job creation, uh, expansion and deepening of our tax revenue base, um, and really filling some voids in terms of our, uh, our infrastructure of amenities which help to improve quality of life. And so, you know, we have a, uh, as I said, a representative sample. This is not an exhaustive list, but these projects cover, and I'm going to tell you what they are in a second, but they cover really four categories of brick and mortar projects uh, that we focus on uh, considerably. So obviously retail, uh, mixed, uh, mixed use, uh, residential, and commercial, which we also call entrepreneurial ecosystem. So uh, up in the left-hand corner, you've got a little uh, rendering showing Westside Place, which is a pretty large, uh, large project, uh, somewhere between 55 and 60 uh, million, which is being done by Vistacore and Armada Hoffler. They recently joined the team as an equity partner. Uh, we're very encouraged by that. Um, Where is that located? Uh, this is located on uh, Hampton, Hampton Boulevard. So it's going to be between, what, 20... 25th and 20, 27th. Uh, so uh, great, great project. They've got uh, LOIs from, from several major national uh, brands. I'm sure we'll talk more about that uh, in the future. Uh, Croker Spot on 30, uh, 35th Street uh, promises uh, to be a great neighborhood uh, project that will perhaps have citywide and regional uh, draw. So Croker Spot, as many of you know, is an institution in Richmond. So they are going to anchor uh, what will be a 56-unit uh, residential project uh, in that in that quarter? So first phase will be the restaurant and the uh, and apartments, and then in the second phase there will be 50 50 apartments. Uh, great great project. So looking at the middle, save a lot, uh, save a lot's investment was just under two million dollars, but I think the potential impact is huge in terms of mitigating. Uh, what is unfortunately a, uh, a food desert uh, on the periphery of downtown. This will also help us tremendously in terms of seeding more development in the greater Church Street uh, corridor. Uh, going back to the left side uh, of the slide, <clears throat> we've got the uh, Maplewoods uh, project, which is also in the Church Street corridor, so about one, $1.2 million. We're going to be doing an event uh, late September, early October, <coughs> probably a hard hat tour. The, uh, the developer's making considerable progress uh, there. Uh, down below is a rendering of the banks at Berkeley, which is a 50-unit project that was approved for tax credits last year. That will be completed next year. Um, more recently, and we don't have an illustration of this, a similar but larger project on Southside uh, was approved by VHDA for tax credits. Uh, that is a project that's being done by the Franklin Johnston Group. So that's going to be roughly 180 units, uh, all within close proximity of, uh, of each other on, on Southside. And let me just say a word about those two projects. When we talk about not just revitalization in some, you know, theoretical sense, but how we create neighborhood economies that consist of more retail, more services, you got to have rooftops. And so that's one of the reasons that I'm personally very excited about those, uh, about those two projects. Uh, in the middle, uh, down below, that's the, uh, that's the Granby building, which uh, houses two of the six spaces that are going to be used 
uh, for the DNC's Vibrant uh, Spaces uh, initiative. So Chuck was part of the selection committee for, uh, for the applicants. We had something like, what, 85 or 90 uh, applicants uh, for a limited uh, number of, of spaces. But the whole idea is to create more street-level vibrancy, you know, and you do that by attracting viable businesses to those spaces. So that's, so that's terrific. Um, just uh, closing this out, uh, East Beach, uh, Phase 7, uh, Councilman Schmeagel, uh, I'm sure is very excited about that. That's going to be phenomenal. Uh, it's going to include not just new rooftops, about 80 new rooftops, but it's going to include some commercial space and some other kinds of flex uh, space, which is great. Um, this is kind of a catch-all photograph that's intended to uh, reflect the incredible number of residential units that have come online within the last four uh, years. So the number exceeds uh, 700 uh, units. And just like I said about the South Side uh, deals, if we want more retail in the downtown and in the urban core. We need more rooftops and we need greater density. So we're getting there in terms of the number of rooftops, but we've got to ensure to the extent that we can that, you know, those rooftops are being built in a way that will give us the density that we need to attract more retail. And so that's exciting. And then finally, again, under the category of entrepreneurial ecosystem, We've got uh, the consolidation of a company that has been in Virginia Beach for a while. This is a major federal contractor, uh, CDI, uh, which is a publicly traded company. And uh, they are going to be consolidating in the uh, Norfolk Industrial uh, Park. And these are great, great jobs, $70,000, $80,000 a year uh, technical uh, and high-skilled uh, jobs. So, uh, obviously, there's a lot of activity going on. Uh, I didn't uh, didn't throw out you know a whole lot of a whole lot of numbers. Some of these are still works in progress, but these are very real uh, projects. And so, just wanted to give you a clear sense of what is happening in a tangible way. Questions. Right. Was before your time. Yes, no. Save a lot. Was that before your time? This opened uh, a month or two after I got here. Okay. Well, you can go ahead and take credit for it, but to everybody else that worked really hard to get sure. Save a Lot here and to fill that need, um, you guys worked overtime. So I, I know the residents are very grateful, and I'm thankful that you were able to work hard to get food and grocery in an area where um, everybody can't possibly, maybe, you know, everybody can't just jump in their car and go somewhere. So um, I appreciate that. It's, yeah. it's, a great, it's a great project. Peter, uh, other questions? I know um, Southern Shopping Center is really changing with the Sam's Club coming in. That's right. And I think there's an opportunity there to see some major improvements along the East Little Creek Road corridor from Denby Park to Military Highway that section but there's um, you know I, I took a drive uh, a very slow Sunday drive down Little Creek Road from the amphibious space to Southern Shopping Center and there's just so many vacant um, car lots and yeah. vacant buildings that if there's any way that we can start with the Sam's Club coming in helping to market that area with potential and working with the SL Nussbaums and the Harvey Lindsay's we're managing a lot of that vacant property yep. uh, and maybe even looking at some residential yep. type structures, quality residential along that because once again you build up the population that helps support the retail. This is the same thing I brought up about Janif area um, and what we could be doing over there to help build that. But there's, we do have these um, deserts <laughs> of empty, or empty buildings um, along some of our retail quarters and I understand what's happening I know that retail has moved more online so a lot of these places are closing but there are things like coffee shops and other yeah. things that could be happening there and I think Sam's Club I know there's going to be some announcements soon yeah. of some other um, retailers coming in in the shopping areas around there uh, but we, we need to keep on capitalizing off of that type of growth as well I know you know it, it may not be a big deal to everybody here but you know, there's no uh, craft store anymore in Norfolk. There's no Michaels. 
Paul's Arts and Crafts. You know, what are we doing to attract that? Um, why does Chesapeake and Virginia Beach have Babies R Us? Um, why don't we have one? It would be great to put one in the Southern Shopping Center area. Uh, you know, everybody always says, why don't we have a Red Lobster in Norfolk? And I know some of those national retailers maybe don't aren't that appealing to some, but it is to others. And so we need to maybe put bugs in people's ears <laughs> and say, why aren't we going after this, these types of retail? And I don't think you can use the excuse anymore about Norfolk's income. Um, our income level is going up. Um, our population is going up. So I don't buy anymore that it's necessarily that. I think it's sometimes um, some of these uh, man property managers are asking for too much. Um, so we need to get them down to lure these places in. But it, somebody just posted on my Facebook, uh, you know, they have to go all the way out to Virginia Beach to go buy arts yeah. and craft stuff. So, you know, and it, it's a little thing like that. Our, our wine stores, you know, uh, once again, popular. Uh, there's no wine stores on some parts of the city to sell quality wine. But I, I think we have to look, um, you know, save a lot's great, and you know, that, that's good when they come in. I don't know if we need any more grocery stores outside of where the deserts are, but you know, we, we gotta work to try to get some other retail for people um, to be able to shop so they don't leave Norfolk to go. And I, I, I know the mayor doesn't like me saying this, but I have to do some shopping in other cities because we don't have it here in Norfolk. So, and that's my rule until it comes to Norfolk. I shop, why doesn't Norfolk have a Kohl's? You know, Kohl's is a great place for people to buy clothes. I'm sure we could work on something, you know, in the Ward's Corner area or Southern Shop. We gotta find places to put the piece. Suffolk is getting a DSW. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Suffolk mm -hmm. is getting a DSW. I, I think those are all good points, and if I if I may, uh, Mr. Manager, we have a second. Uh, I think that uh, expanding and diversifying our retail offerings is really a it's a function of a lot of things, and among them uh, is retail. I'm sorry, is residential. Um, that matters significantly. Um, it's also a function of our developer partners because in many instances, retailers don't just follow rooftops, they follow rooftops, but they also follow the developers. And so, you know, we did something a few months ago called 36 Hours in Norfolk. We're gonna do that on an ongoing basis. And the whole purpose of it was to begin to get on the radar in a systematic way of national uh, stakeholders, developers, site selectors, because those are the entities that really work with many of the national retailers. That we're, that we're talking about. Uh, that's a much more effective, much more efficient way of bringing those retailers to the table and systematically getting on their radar rather than doing it, uh, you know, uh, retailer by, by retailer. Um, so I just wanted to share that perspective with you. You talk about rooftops, and I get that, but like in some of these areas where we have these vacancies, there are, and, and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody who rents, but tenants can leave. Their lease is up in a year or two years or whatever, and they move. But we have high numbers of home ownership in these areas, people who have made commitments to staying somewhere for at least five to 10 years, and yet we still have these vacancies. Um, you know, and, and, and these are not low priced homes. Yeah. You know, homes either. We're talking, you know, $150,000, $300,000 homes right. that come with incomes and, yeah. you know, all of that too. So um, I get the developer part, but they're just, and maybe that is the piece that's missing. It just seems like there's something that is just not connecting. And maybe it is the developer piece. There, there because are the money, yeah. you're right, I mean, not just the incomes, but people are buying and they own. And so the money is here, um, you know. So, but thank you for what you are doing. Thank, thank you. Good evening, mayors, members of the council. This is a progress report on the commercial corridor um, and city streetwide lighting um, 
program that we um, brought to you last fall in our in your council retreat. Um, we brought recommendations for how the use of the previous uh, um, neighborhood and commercial corridor monies uh, that we had um, recommendation for complete streets and placemaking. Um, and what I'm going to give you an update on is is where we these were the recommendations that we had for you last fall, um, and we also have added. Uh, three additional projects here because the process by which we've taken the input and developed the, the implementation recommendations is all the same. Uh, we added uh, Lafayette Boulevard neighborhood plan project, the Chelsea Business District where that was some of the, the additional general fund money that we had, and then the city uh, wide street lighting project. Um, the process we've used to, to uh, for input of all this, we were committed that we would get task force and civic league input. and so. Each of you individually has, has seen, have seen some of this input and engagement. Uh, James Rogers and Neighborhood Development led the process for how to liaison with the Civic Leagues and task forces. And then David Ricks and Richard Broad, Chris Chambers from Public Works, and Jason Baines and Tron Krowetsky from our posts uh, took that input and were the creative team that helped come up with the recommendations uh, for the use of these monies. And then Jerry Riddick and Public Works has led our, our street, uh, city street lighting program. Uh, so we have three projects that are underway, five that are in design, and then four of the areas that are still in concept development, two of which were the better block areas, in it, and I'll walk you through that. So the, the Chelsea Business District, uh, highlight that, um, they were very judicious with their with the 100000 that was uh, allocated for that area. Uh, they concentrated on um, and, and, and heard some of the the input about what complete streets and placemaking were, and we're looking at what the how the, the district is evolving. Um, and so they were very specific in their input for where they saw that sidewalk improvements, ADA ramps uh, should can help also street lighting um, along the main corridor or Oropac Street, which connects several of the destinations in the district, um, and then have some bike, uh, bike racks that will be installed uh, soon um, along with a, a bike um, repair uh, station. Um, so building off the Elizabeth River Trail and then also what's happening that's a very pedestrian uh, friendly district. Um, this this is what's going on, and this this will should be complete uh, in, in the month of September. The complete project, uh, Kali Avenue, um, across from Fresh Market at Twenty uh, First Street, um, across the street and, and adjacent to it was the last segment of uh, Carter of Twenty First Street to receive the Twenty First the Ghent Twenty First Street Kali Avenue streetscape um, improvements. So from Granby Street along 21st Street all the way to Isaiah Court at Fresh Market now uh, we will have the same standard that we have in our in our plan and again this project should wrap up uh, in in uh, September October as well um, this pr predominantly um, improved the sidewalks made sure the crossings and ADA ramps uh, were improved and then added the uh, the decorative lighting that is uh, prevalent along the 21st Street uh, for that standard uh, the last uh, one that's underway uh, to be completed this fall is the East Little Creek uh, Road Commercial Carter. Uh, when asked of uh, the, the East Little Creek Task Force, they wanted to continue the median treatment that's in, in, in the Carter. Um, and so there are two, uh, two areas of medians um, that are working to establish tree pits um, and um, proper um, pedestrian crossings for that area. That construction's underway, and again, that'll finish uh, this fall. So you will see from where Military Highway intersects at Little Creek Road, um, it's not far from there that, that, that those improvements are, are being done now. Now, projects and design, some of this is we, we've had final input and some we're still we're taking some input um, because we have to go back and do costing for, uh, for some of these projects. Um, this is a very robust project, uh, the Lafayette Boulevard uh, design, but essentially what it does is this, it, this is a, a significant demonstration project for complete streets. Um, the idea here is that, that we will take the corridor um, and have both bikeability, parking, uh, pedestrian improvements, streetscapes, um, and still the ability uh, to handle traffic uh, through that corridor. Um, and this is from the Tidewater Drive east uh, to Lyons Avenue, where you see where you see the triangle there. Um, that this will be done. Is that the build in the building behind the Pollard's chicken? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're right now we're in um, cost estimating design for this input, and we'll look at. Um, whether or not we can, within the, the million dollars, can we do everything that, that we have conceptually, um, or do we need to phase some of that as well? 
Um, and this will also build off and bridge connection to our bike corridor plan that we mentioned, Susan Pollock mentioned to you a couple uh, months ago. Uh, what is uh, Public Works doing uh, in that particular corridor uh, to uh, repair those streets over there? Uh, right where that corner is, where you go on the top left, uh, that's a street uh, that, that the residents have been complaining about. Another street behind that where people's cleaners is called Flanders Street. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, it's just. Now, the last excuse I got was the fact that they were doing some underground utility work and they did not want to do the street resurfacing. Okay. So, is that, I guess you'd have to get that out from Public Works. Yeah, we'll get David to, to look into whether or not that, where that is, it should be realistically on a resurfacing. Now, landscape. on the, on Lafayette Boulevard, I don't know whether it's in conjunction with where you are or not, but at the old, old Tony's Hot Dogs location, you see a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, it's like a staging area. Right. And then down from there, it looks like a staging area. Uh, is that is that public work? David, is that public work for what? Um, <laughs> on Lafayette Boulevard, uh, and that would be on the corner of Lens Avenue. Okay. And uh, it uh, looks like a staging area for some type of public works projects. You have a lot of dirt and gravel in there. It's Fairmont Park area. Yeah. They were still yeah, doing that sewer the, water line replacement. Yeah, it right. is. That's where they're keeping price. all of that material right. for yeah. the sewer water. They're in, I don't know what phase they're, they're in. Like phase but they're like phase 25 yeah, of Fairmont Park. <laughs> and they're down million, to like Lynn's yeah. Avenue now. They're down at Lynn's Avenue. It's all torn up. And so they're actually in the middle of that area. And they're going to be doing that for a while. And they're actually getting to the people's cleaners area to get that. That's in, that they're getting there to that area to get that street, because that street is horrible. Yeah, because they're back on Cromwell right now doing... But yeah. you know what, I have another question with where, and this is not regarding this, but it's to economic development. And little businesses like that, like the People's Cleaners and the Manny's Hot Dogs and the, the, the small places that um, are not as visually attractive as they could be. Is there any way that we can do, I know we had, uh, there was some program some years ago where if the business owner spent X amount of dollars for facade improvement, we matched it or something. It's all in that. Can we do something like that to, I mean, is, are, are, is there money for that stuff anymore? Because many is, I mean, they've been there forever, but it looks a hot mess. Yeah, they were, they but were they've been there forever. forever, and they probably they're probably aren't going anywhere. They got great hot dogs, but we yeah, could. I mean, could we help them? And, and the people's cleaners. I mean, you know, everybody likes them. There, yeah, and and whatever that other place is, the yellow one there, you know, to help them look appealing, so people who don't know that they're great will want to go there and spend their money. <laughs> This is my understanding, and, and I'll answer for because I, I looked a lot into the facade improvement program. Just people weren't taking advantage of it. It was a 50% match, but people weren't spending the, the, the owners of the property did not want to put the money into it. So the money was kind of just sitting there, not being used, and it was taken out and now merged into. Um, projects that we can actually do as opposed to I mean it wasn't that much but it was out there and I so that. but okay we, that's we, what that money was for yeah because we had like a hundred twenty five thousand uh, or seventy five thousand excuse me at um, on Little Creek Road and just for six or seven years just, just sat, sat there, there. nobody and, and they some of it is the city didn't do a lot of outreach at some point but when they did nobody wanted to match it nobody was willing to put and if they did it was usually big shopping center owners and have the capacity to do it anyway. It wasn't the little guys. And, and so in those numbers though, I, I stepped down that first $2.7 million, we left a very little bit of capacity for to continue a facade improvement program if somebody would be willing to take you know, that 50-50 match. So, there's a, so it's not totally going away, but we left a little bit so that just in case with the opportunity arose, we could do something. It's so. like maybe reaching out to those people yeah. that are that are there from 
um, you know, from development or like on Virginia Beach Boulevard where the Richway Market moved and now there's some other hair and beauty store there. And I mean, it, it looks a hot mess. And it, if they're willing to spend some money and they're going to get some money back, then maybe, you know, we could reach out to those places because that's a major core. That's a major thoroughfare coming out Virginia Beach Boulevard. And you go through a nice neighborhood. You know, we've got the Broad Creek area, we've got the Great 7-Eleven and BP, and then you cross the bridge, and then it's crap, really, once you get to that light at the bottom of the bridge to Ingleside Road. Except the people at the Little Sitco, they do a really good job of trying to keep that area clean and they work with the Civic League. But from the light at the bottom of the bridge, it, it looks horrible. So maybe we can reach out. If, if we've got control of the money, then we can set some parameters that might be more helpful to smaller businesses and more affordable for them. You know, you don't have to spend 100000 and get 50 back. Maybe you can spend 10000 and get 5 back or something like that. That might be more doable. But anyway. And look at the, Sorry. Um, the convenience store on Lafayette Boulevard and maybe find out what they did because they became good partners in the community, the one stop. They reinvested their own money. Yeah. They reinvested their own money though. Yeah, that wasn't our money. Okay. That was their money. All right. Sorry, go on. North Collie uh, is a unique project. Um, we're excited about this. Uh, uh, it, for, they we recommended uh, traffic calming on North Collie, but the, the, the area really wanted a kayak and stand up paddle boarding launch. Um, so we we're able to come up with a design uh, that's achievable uh, in the monies that, that are appropriated um, and also leverage actually the, the work of the grant that was mentioned earlier in the Lafayette watershed. For the living shoreline this will this will play right uh, well into that across the creek here um, so this um, this is in design now uh, we've gotten some final estimates as of uh, as of this week um, so it, it's very implementable old Huntersville um, really went for uh, one key project uh, which is a gateway sign um, and then also some um, hardscape infrastructure improvements throughout the area uh, this is at um, the intersection of Tidewater Drive uh, and Chapel Street, if you're going southbound, essentially at that triangle there um, that's marked here on the map. Um, and that, that image uh, is, is a little hard to see in 2D, but it is, a, it is a curved sign to take advantage of the way the road goes and the way that that triangle uh, sets up in that intersection. Um, Ward's Corner, um, I think it was about a 30 second discussion. Uh, at the task force because they knew exactly what we wanted to do, continue to build on the work that had been done in the area, um, and that is uh, for signal improvements at Admiral Tossic Boulevard with Little Creek Road, um, pedestrian improvements. And what this does essentially is give um, good pedestrian corridor from the HRT um, transfer station that is up here just off of Granby all the way over to the shopping district um, along, along that way. So this is a, a good pedestrian improvement, complete streets uh, um, project. In Bramble Avenue, we were approved for the VDOT revenue sharing um, that you passed the ordinance for um, last fall, so we were able to do that and leverage uh, this uh, one, one to one match uh, for the improvements at um, Monticello and Granby Street um, and to continue like we've done uh, where you see the other intersections at Collie Avenue, um, New York Street, um, in the Freemason area. So this, um, this treatment to Bramble Avenue and how we do the pedestrian crossings is planned to go all the way to the interstate by Norfolk State. Um, as funding becomes available uh, over the years. Uh, so we'll continue that standard here. I have one more question. You mentioned Norfolk State. Um, we put that barrier up along the um, median there. Yes. And I've seen no less than three times where somebody's had an accident or whatever and it's just been mangled. We're not paying for those replacements, are we? Tell me we're going after somebody's insurance agency who caused the accident to pay for replacing those things along the median, right? I don't know about that. Um, the silence means we are playing for it. The attorney down here would have to say so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that we have we a policy of, of recouping uh, damages caused by anybody's negligence, and so that we have a reporting system. And I can't say that every incident gets reported, but the policy is that every incident should be. Reported by who? Um, the police are one of the major responders at okay. scenes. Uh, we have a risk manager who also is involved. Um, utilities has a lot of uh, apparatus out there. Mm -hmm. The last couple of years, we had um, 
one of our major water pipes on the Elizabeth hit, and we recovered uh, eight nine hundred thousand dollars in damage from it. And so that our policy is that, uh, like with any owner of property, if you damage it negligently, then we're going to um, ask for um, you to repair it, pay the cost. Okay. So can somebody tell me how many um, of those things we replaced? What the cost is to pay for? Like in sure. about thirty days. Yes. Okay. And I just emailed. And, and, Bernard about um, simple things like trees and landscaping that get damaged from a car accident mm -hmm. and how that gets reported and I, I think he's communicated to uh, the police about maybe looking at how we do that to improve that process because when a tree gets knocked over somebody needs to get billed for it we shouldn't have to replace the tree without somebody paying for it if it's an accident. Does Kiper know these projects are moving forward by the way? <laughs> no. He may come back to you. You always wanted to do That's true. Uh, now, I will say, Vice Mayor, to your question, um, we are looking at some alternative um, uh, products uh, from the decorative aluminum fencing because it happens so often. It is hard to, re uh, to replace, particularly when it's um, embedded in concrete. Um, so Public Works has been researching to try to find some other products that might be a little more durable. So need to speed up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, these are the, the, the four areas that are in concept uh, development. Really building up, we've, we're, work, you're, we're using the classic charrette process. These are follow-ups to the better block process. 35th Street, we're still working on, on the concepts uh, with them. Uh, and we, we have some recommendations we'll be bringing back for their feedback this fall. Uh, one uh, of which it is to, to have the center turn lane of 35th Street um, be actually a cycle track, which is a two-lane um, um, bike, uh, bike lane. Um, East Beach, Commercial Carter, we are uh, still working through because there's significant movement and whether or not um, uh, who is going to be where and whether or not there's any sale of property, uh, what approach. So we're, we're working through that um, in that area right now. Five points, we've had two input sessions and we're going to be uh, coming back in, in uh, October uh, with recommendations to the community based on the, the input session uh, that we held in, in, Ju in July. Uh, and then Riverview, uh, we are still continuing to work through concepts. Uh, they, they've asked for a gateway project. Uh, we've, we're also looking at uh, traffic calming um, and we're working through whether or not some of the concepts are feasible uh, because of the interference with utilities. Um, so we'll continue to work through these and those of you that participate on the task forces that host these um, will see that work. Um, the citywide street light projects, uh, just a couple minutes on that. Um, you provided 400,000 uh, to improve street light citywide. 90% uh, of those projects are complete. Um, the, the, the time to do that um, for each, each street light, it, there is a nine month um, order delay for, for implementation from Virginia. <coughs> um, so we've, we've achieved a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of that because of the time we've had um, and they, they, that will be finished this fall. Essentially what the project was, was changing the type of bulb um, and, then incre and then adding new bulbs and, and new lights uh, where we didn't have lights. Um, and one of the, uh, the prioritization that we used, we did look at crime hotspots and then we also looked at the backlog of neighborhoods um, that, or, or where the, we, we didn't have any lights. Um, and this was how the lights were distributed. One significant project was in the Huntersville area where we actually had 400 poles that received new lights. Um, and, and the images aren't the best here, but to give you a, uh, some understanding of the difference in the lights that were there, the yellow type of street light that we've seen historically um, all across Hampton Roads is the image that you see on the left, and the new, the brighter white light that's got a hotter, hotter and, and, and more uh, area coverage actually uh, shows the sidewalks in the neighborhood and also really uh, is, a, is a better light. Um, so that's a good project that uh, Public Works is um, nearly complete. Yeah, thank you. So in next year's budget, we're going to keep on funding these types of things, right? We'll keep moving these. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right, Sabrina? <laughs> you said we'll keep that moving That was not ahead. a yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. He didn't say yes. We're going to fund it. That was the indirect answer. <laughs> it is really money well spent. It is. Members of Council, Mayor Frame, and City Manager Marcus Jones. Um, I'm here to give you a couple updates on some projects going on at the zoo to talk a little bit about our elephant program. Um, I know that many people are fans of our uh, zoo farm, and I want to thank uh, members of the council and the mayor for your contribution through city CIP. Uh, 
to help fund part of this project. It's really a great renovation that contains six different barn-like buildings on our zoo farm, and we're painting those each a different primary color. So it's going to be pretty exciting. We're cleaning up the path. We've <coughs> renovated the inside of the barn, uh, but it's really, really going to be uh, very pretty. We're also creating an exhibit that represents our sister, sister city zoo in Kitakishku, Japan, uh, in this area, and that'll be opening this spring. So get ready for the biggest guinea pig habit trail you've ever seen, because guinea pigs are very popular in Japan. So, but it'll be awesome. Um, and you may not recognize this building, but this is the entrance to our reptile building as it is now. If you've been there in the past 30 years, it's pretty hidden. Yes. Um, we're working with a design group now um, to renovate this building. It's a $2.6 million project. Um, and this will be the new front facade where you'll actually be able to see it from the, the center um, water plaza as you enter the zoo. So it'll give a whole new entrance. It's doubling the exhibit capacity of that um, building so it'll be very spectacular it's about a 50 week uh gut and renovation project and this what's, is our what's your timetable for that uh, um we should be signing the contract within the next 60 days and then start uh and be 50 week 50 weeks from then um and then you might remember the alligator exhibit anyone in this room from 1938 that's just kind of an interesting picture we uh, found recently for our, <laughs> our 115 year anniversary is next year, so we're digging into our photos. But the new alligator exhibit will be pretty spectacular. It's in addition to the building, so um, it'll be pretty awesome. So hope you look forward to that. Do you have alligators there now? We don't. No, I'm not sure where they went, but um, that was a while ago. Um, and as we discussed um, in the recent past, and it was in the newspaper, um, our standards and guidelines for how we maintain elephants in AZA zoos have changed. Um, as we learn more about animals, what we learn is applied to um, all of the AZA accredited institutions across the country. But there's about 70 zoos that hold elephants in the U.S. About 20 of those have two or fewer elephants. And what we've learned in the recent past, um, according to studies that have been done about body condition, behavior, um, what animals really need, which what they really need is social community. They need to kind of regain their family structure. They need more exercise. They need all, all these things to keep them happy and healthy. So um, we do have to meet the AZA deadline, which is next month, to determine what we're going to do with our elephants. Um, you can see here that each zoo is uh, to hold a minimum of three female elephants or other combination of sexes. And then in parentheses there it says, or have the space to hold three female elephants. Um, and then our deadline for implementation, what our change might be, is September of next year. Um, and so the most recent data about elephants um, is about just the things I mentioned. Social relationships, they need to be maintained in larger groups. When elephants came into the country, you can imagine they were probably sent off in their ones, twos, and threes to different zoos where they really occur in large matriarchal matriarchal groups in the wild. Um, so they really lose their species identity, so they don't breed well in captivity. And then when they do breed, there's disease issues that have affected their reproduction and the survivability of their, of their offspring. So um, elephants are a very smart animal, as you know. They're very social. So they really need those cho choices in their life, their relationships of what they do um, in the zoo that they live in. Um, and then really the, the landscape across what they live to. They need more exercise, more space, um, and they really honestly need a climate that allows for that sort of activity. Like I mentioned, elephants in the wild, they live in tropical regions. They're gregarious, live in family herds. The females all live together with their offspring. Uh, males live differently. They primarily live um, on their own um, until they, they only come into the large herds uh, during breeding seasons. Um, and they largely feed on low quality vegetation. So they eat a lot of grass. I think they digest only about 40% of what they eat. So they're constantly moving and grazing. Um, and then elephants in captivity, they've been in captivity for a long, long time. Um, and as I mentioned, they, there's a loss of that herd, uh, social nature in captivity. So they've kind of lost a little bit of their species identity. There's reproductive challenges. Um, there's conservation value whether we house elephants or not because they are such a popular megavertebrate. And then in captivity also, we've changed from a, a, 
zoos or captivity where you actually touch elephants, handle elephants, or you're within contact uh, with elephants. Now they're actually moved, they're shifted um, as you would a carnivore, a large carnivore, because elephants have historically killed the largest number of zookeepers in captivity. And that's really because they communicate on such a, a big level because they're such a big animal. Um, and then when they're angry, they're angry. So, um, but zoos that no longer are exhibiting Elephants, for one reason or another, um, tend to do with climate. They have an older exhibit if they're landlocked. Uh, a new elephant exhibit might cost you 30 to $40 million to accommodate the number of animals that you need. Uh, but you can see this list of zoos uh, that have given up their elephants already. And then even as we know that uh, the circus is not going to be performing with elephants after 2017, <coughs> I think it is. Um, so our decision of what we might do with our elephants is based on what the AZA management standards um, are, but they also include what we feel is best for our elephants. You know, what's, what's, the, what's the best place for them to go? What sort of climate do we want for our animals? Space, what are the social opportunities? Um, and you know, what's really good for their golden years? Um, some zoos that are really focusing on putting together larger populations of elephants have a dedicated zookeeping team that just works with the elephants. They don't work with other animals. At our zoo, we don't really have that luxury. We have a, a lead person over our elephants and the people that work with those animals also work all of the animals that are in that um, Africa section of animals. So there's a little bit of difference between um, how each zoo is able to maintain their elephants and care for their elephants. So all of that really goes into the decision-making process for our zoo management team, um, what we might look for for our elephants. Um, and then with regards to our Virginia Zoological Society and our strategic planning, we've been discussing this for about a year. It's been involved in the zoo director's meetings probably for the past five years, um, or what's going to happen with elephants. Um, so we discuss all of that, of course, in the strategic planning. Our short-term goals have to then do our zoo farm, our reptile building, our animal hospital, and renovate our restroom, or I mean restaurants. And then from a collection standpoint, it's about uh, acquisitions and deacquisitions of animals, and then all about elephant welfare. Um, and then our long-term goals will include the next big capital project and any other um, large kind of uh, zoo community type project. So what we're really looking at is doing what's best for our elephants. They're managed today differently than they were in the past, primarily because of more of what we learn about those animals, just like any animal in the zoo business. I remember in the recent past, they determined that chimpanzees should only be housed in groups of six animals or more because they do learn their, they, they do lose a significant amount of their species identity and they start to behave more like the people watching them than they do their own species because there's uh, fewer of themselves to really learn and be social with. So it's kind of the same thing with elephants. We've learned a lot about elephants in the, in the past 10 years. But we know they need more contact with other elephants. Uh, they need the right climate and space to exercise. And not only for that, when you introduce elephants again to each other, older animals like ours, they do need that space to really negotiate each other and create those relationships with each other. Um, and they are designed and we're raised to have multiple relationships. Um, so you can imagine if when we lose one of our elephants, we'll have a single animal left, and there really just aren't a lot of elephants available uh, because they haven't bred well in captivity. Um, they haven't had the social structures um, to um, add animals easily. A lot of exhibits weren't built that were large enough to accommodate larger groups of animals. Um, so there's significant issues, and that's why the AZA rules have pretty much um, changed. But of course, like any of our exhibits, our exhibits do focus on education, conservation, and recreation. Oh. Does anybody have any particular questions? I got a couple of questions. Uh, do we still have two elephants? We do. Okay. And uh, what about the demand? I mean, the children come to want to see elephants, and and if we and if Franklin Brothers is dropping elephants, would that increase that demand for? Maybe if somebody want to see elephants in the coming right. zoo. Elephants, I would say, are probably the most popular zoo animal. They're the megavertebrate. Yeah, so they're right up there with lions and giraffe and rhinos. 
Um, but the most popular animal at zoos are baby animals. We know that if you have lion cubs, that's about an additional 40,000 people visiting your zoo in a year. So uh, if we send our elephants off, we have a plan for other animals that in that exhibit that we should be able to deliver more to our conservation message and breed those animals and do the whole life cycle. So it would be bringing another species of animal that could reproduce. So I don't feel we'd lose uh, attendance. Um, and then with regards to the circus, those are Asian elephants that are part of that uh, circus company. They're being brought to a farm in Florida. Um, and nobody really knows what they're going to be doing with their elephants. They are the most successful breeder of elephants, too, in the U.S., so that's pretty interesting. How much does an elephant cost? Uh, well, they're not really sold. It's transport okay. fees. It might cost $40,000 to move one elephant right. across the country. Any chance of getting the Ringling Brothers elephants? Well, because they're a different species, um, um, yeah, we would. It's not recommended to mix them. That's the ones going to Florida. That's right. Yeah. And Florida does going to a great job at the breed. Well, that That's Florida facility for okay. the circus facility does. Is it because because of climate? And well, they have the numbers. They have okay. a large number of animals. Um, they're exercised. They have a big farm. So great. It's great. Did you mention how old our elephants are? Our elephants are forty-two. And what, are, what is the typical lifespan? Well, they can live anywhere from 40. I think the oldest in captivity is 55. Right, so, so okay. they could have another 10 uh, years if they had left in them. Yeah. But then we would, because our elephants are healthy too, it's now time to kind of talk about this. Um, they could travel well. Um, so rather than wait and one passes away and then our option becomes it's kind of um, a bit more difficult. Uh, it's just a conversation we need to have now. Um, I, I love our zoo. You guys do a great job. I was just at the National Zoo, and I think our zoo's better. I mean, they have pandas. You know, we don't have pandas, but it's okay. Yeah. We have um, more red pandas, uh, which my kids love, and Paul loves them. So, uh, but. I, I think one thing that is missing from our zoo, I've been to the Pittsburgh Zoo, um, you know, this zoo, the outside of our zoo, um, the, the inviting, it, it is a drive up zoo, you drive up, you get out of your car and you go, but it kind of goes back to what Ron just went over with the river view and Church Street corridors and creating an environment that people have other things to do when they go to the zoo. I mean, even a Starbucks, there was a Starbucks right across the street from, you know, the National Zoo. Or there's nothing to do over there right outside. Um, fixing Lafayette Park up a little bit more to be more inviting and attractive. Uh, a lot of times when the zoo gets really, really busy, you have to park over um, in Lafayette and the connections to the zoo are not that great. Uh, if you have a stroller and you've got to park all the way over by the tennis courts trying to get through that. So those types of things we should look at as well and uh, how we can celebrate this. Because how many visitors did you have last year? Uh, 493,000. 493,000 people, some repeat like me, you know, uh, but that's got to attract retail. <laughs> it's got to attract something outside that corridor and, and maybe when we start making those improvements in that area it could help it'd be great to be able to park a car across the street from the zoo walk into the zoo then come back and eat at a restaurant i know it's kind of inching its way there from um, riverview but it's still too far away so we've got to find a way to connect it there's about six times during the year that we park up lafayette park right on the grass um, so it's just kind of an interesting concept we've looked at, you know, what's additional park, where do our visitors work or walk to the zoo, like yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. The, um, for what it's worth, the, the original master plan, it's your working plan, I guess, at 35th Street, coming all the way across Granby and into the Visit park place. area. Oh, yeah. And then there was, there was parking, but the whole idea was that the hope was that as the zoo improved, that people would actually visit restaurants on 35th Street. You know, that that might be a source of retail and there. Yeah. And so, but we ran out of money. We never had enough money to bring this. And then we, we were going to lose some park space. So I'm sure there's a, there'll be a, 
discussion about cutting trees and things like that if you ever did that or you did back then. So, but Tommy, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, it's had multiple experience things. Nice and driven. How do we rank compared to other zoos when it comes to attendance? Um, I would say we're a solid middle-sized zoo. And it's interesting on our surveys too that people do mention that they really like the open greenness because often I'm asked do we have enough space to expand, but we really need to remember to keep that open greenness really in a, a busy city because you can see your kids run far ahead of you and still feel it's like 54, 55 acres, right? Yep, about 55 acres yeah. inside the fence. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So the members of council is some late closed meeting on August 25, 6.34 p.m. The purpose is set out in clauses 1 and 3, section 14-3711 of the Community Freedom of Information Act. That is one discussion for consideration of the prospective candidates. In a county zoo, there's a lot of city work front back there that has used it yeah, now. Three discussions for disposition of public land, real property in downtown East Ocean. Remember, we took a move at the environmental center there. Ms. Graves? 55 acres. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smigel? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. Mr. Dray? 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 M